So let's join together in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to meet together in your name. Lord, we just ask that you will anoint not just the speaking but the hearing, Lord, that you would speak into our hearts that which you desire to impart so that your name will truly be glorified. We thank you for your word and we thank you that your word is truth and it's truth that sets us free. So give us eyes to see and ears to hear for we'd ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, the last days. Are you ready? Well, this is what we read in Matthew 16, 1 to 3. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, When evening comes, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today, it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Israel was at a crossroads. The long-awaited Messiah had arrived, but the religious leaders were blind to that reality. And Jesus rebuked them for displaying a lack of spiritual discernment. They could read the physical signs of what the weather was going to be like tomorrow, but they were blind to the prophetic signs. And their lack of discernment placed them in grave spiritual danger, as Jesus said in Luke 19.44. They missed the day of their visitation. You see, prophecy accounts for a major portion of the scriptures. The Bible has 31,124 verses and at least 8,362 verses were prophetic in nature when they were written down, which accounts for over one quarter of the Bible. Now, we've just celebrated, of course, the birth of Jesus, which fulfilled a number of Old Testament prophecies given centuries before the event took place. And one of those best-known prophecies in the Bible is Matthew 1, 23. The virgin will be with child and will, will give birth to a son and they will call him and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now this, of course, is a fulfilment of a prophecy from Isaiah made more than 700 years earlier. And then after Christ's birth, the Magi arrived in Jerusalem searching for where he was going to be born. And so Herod gathered the chief priests and scribes and they asked them where Messiah was to be born and they cited Micah 5 and verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. And this is where the true bread from heaven came to earth. This defenceless little baby, of course, was born with the shadow of a, a cross over him. 33 years later, his body, the bread of life, was nailed to a cross for the sin of the world and his blood was shed on our behalf. When King Herod realised he'd been outwitted by the Magi, his jealousy and anger led to slaughtering the young boys of Bethlehem from two years old and under, which of course led to the fulfilment of other prophecies. For example, Jeremiah 31, 15. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. And due to Herod's intention to kill Jesus, the Lord directed Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt remaining there until the time was right to come home and settle in Nazareth, fulfilling the prophecy of Hosea 11, verse 1. Out of Egypt I called my son. Now, because there are many other prophecies connected to the life, death and resurrection of Jesus that were literally fulfilled. You see, prophecy has been given to bring light, hope and encouragement for all who read it and take it to heart. Now, the second coming of Jesus is a truth that dominates the New Testament. It is taught approximately 318 times in the New Testament, and out of the 27 New Testament books, 23 books mention the second coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, there are approximately 300 prophecies connected to the first coming of Jesus and 600 regarding his second coming. 
Now, a term often connected to prophecy is the last days. And the question becomes, when did the last days begin and how long will they last for? Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through his prophets, through the prophets, at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. You see, the coming of Jesus Christ into the world was the decisive point in history where the word became flesh and dwelt among us, ushering in the last days, setting in motion a train of events that would bring about the redemption of sinners and the culmination of God's plans and purposes. But you see, the end is not a fleeting moment. It is a period of time which marks a new stage in God's dealings with the world. But the Bible also makes it very clear there are a number of signs pointing to the truth and reality that we are living in the last of the last days. And so in this session, we're just going to look at some of those signs. And so as we turn to some prophetic teaching which Jesus gave, we find a clear warning, an indication of what this world would be like just prior to his second coming. And so we need to see what we can learn from the days of Noah and Lot, since Jesus said that those past experiences would be replayed in the world leading up to his return. So speaking of his second coming, Jesus said this in Luke 17, 26 to 30. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulphur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this the day the Son of Man is revealed. The biblical account of Noah begins in Genesis 6, which is approximately 1,600 years since the creation of Adam and Eve. And as the earth's population exploded in number, it also burst forth with evil, depravity and decay. Genesis 6 and verse 1. When men began to increase in number on the earth. You see, the days of Noah occurred when there was a rapid increase in population. The Hebrew word in verse 1, translated as increase, means to multiply rapidly. Now, we live in a times where there has been an unprecedented rise in human population. From 1492 to 1918, a period of approximately 400 years, the world's population increased from 500 million people to 2 billion people. And then from 1918 to 1962, a period of approximately 40 years, the world's population increased from 2 to 3 billion people. And then from 1962 to the year 2000, another 40-year period, the world's population doubled from 3 to 6 billion people. The population is now past 7.8 billion, and it's estimated that the world's population is increasing by approximately 80 million people every year, which is over three times the population of Australia. Well, that reading continues on in Genesis 6, 1 to 4. When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. The Nephilim, who were on the earth in those days and also afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. Some say that the sons of God were the godly line of Seth, who intermingled with the wicked descendants of Cain. But how could these ordinary people be able to create the Nephilim, who were also giants? You see, the sons of God who married the daughters of men produced the Nephilim, which means the fallen ones. While the Hebrew phrase for the sons of God is Ben Elohim, is not mentioned anywhere else in the Old Testament except for the book of Job. For example, Job 1 and verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, Ben Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. You see, Job is not referring to the children of Seth as the son of God, 
but to angels. And on several occasions in scripture, of course, angels are recorded as eating food and interacting with humans. Therefore, they have some ability to interact with the material world. Well, others would say, though, well, the sons of God cannot refer to angels as they are unable to procreate, quoting Matthew 22, verse 30. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, the text does not say angels are not able to marry or procreate. Rather, it indicates, indicates angels do not marry. Secondly, this verse is referring to angels in heaven. It's not referring to fallen angels who do not care about God's created order. And we are told that God imprisoned the fallen angels who had committed this sin in Jude verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. You see, in Noah's time, there was a satanic intrusion and influence over people's lives, resulting in the furtherance of evil and depravity. Now, of course, in our day and age, with the advancement in technology and science, mankind is playing around with what God created and ordained through things like genetic engineering, robotics, cloning, transhumanism and, and artificial intelligence. Well... A further comparison to the days of Noah and the last days in which we live tells us human society will reach a state of total moral disintegration. Genesis 6 verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. In Noah's time, the people of the earth were constantly focused on self and preoccupied with wickedness and evil. The Hebrew term for evil all the time means all day, from morning right through to night. An incredible picture of the complete depravity of man's inner nature. Society today is exactly the same. The witness of God's truth has deliberately been silenced, pushed aside due to the wickedness of man's hearts and abandoned for a more palatable, sensitive and inoffensive form of religion based on moral relativism which ignores the absolutes of God's word. Romans 1 and verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. You see, when a society suppresses and rejects God and the truth of his word, there will always be consequences and cause great damage, destruction, mutilation and sets humanity on a downward spiral. Now, Matthew 24 is a passage that speaks about signs of the Lord's return. And verse 12 aptly describes what is taking place today and what took place in the time of Noah and Lot. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. You see, lawlessness is the abandoning of God's word. You remove God's law, what are you left with? Lawlessness. People do as they please. And the closer we get to the second coming of Jesus, the greater the efforts of Satan to remove the word of God and his laws completely from human civilization. You see, lawlessness gained a great foothold throughout the theory of evolution, which attacked the foundation of God's word. Liberal theologians have for a long time cast a shadow of doubt over God's word, denying and rejecting the supernatural components to the Bible. Then there was the introduction of political correctness, which says we are not to offend anybody with the truth. There are anti-discrimination and anti-vilification laws and some religious freedom bills which all seek to silence the free proclamation of God's word. And then, of course, there's the woke movement. Woke being the term that its supporters use to describe their awakening to issues of race, gender and sexuality, which often stands, of course, in opposition to the word of God and yet is supported by many so-called Christian leaders. When a church goes woke, they are more interested in skin colour rather than the gospel. Social justice and saving the planet becomes their priority rather than saving souls. Now, there are nations, of course, all around the world who have been criminalising portions of the Bible and there is a steady broadening in many countries of what qualifies as biblical hate speech today. 
with the anti-conversion laws that were passed by the Victorian government led by Daniel Andrews, a pastor could be imprisoned for up to 10 years or fined up to $200,000 for proclaiming the biblical view of human sexuality or helping someone who is struggling with their gender identity. While Christians could be criminalised because they prayed with someone who was looking for help regarding their sexuality. These laws come into force next month. You see, these hate crime laws are being used to outlaw the Bible and to criminalise expressions of biblical truth. Those who reject God's word are set on silencing Christians and Christian pulpits all in the name of cause of, of tolerance, acceptance and diversity. Well, we're given further insight into the outworkings of wickedness, evil and lawlessness in the time of Lot. Jude, verse 7. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the time of Noah and Lot, sexual corruption was widespread. And today our society is just the same. Since 2001, 31 countries around the world have legalised same-sex marriage. And in the time of Lot, there were gangs of militant homosexuals who roamed the streets. And the two angels who came to Lot said they would spend the night in the square. But Lot insisted that they stay with him. We pick up the account in Genesis 19, 4 and 5. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so that we can have sex with them. Today, the LGBTIQ communities and many of those supportive of them have become very militant and aggressive, particularly attacking Bible-believing Christians who take a stand on God's word against such perversions. They label Christians as, as bigots, accused of hate crimes, and are often demonised by the media. Remember Margaret Court, Israel Folau? And of course, they're just the tip of the iceberg. But lawlessness continues to be expressed in other ways. We've got cancel culture, we've got Antifa, we've got Black Lives Matter, we've got rebellion, rebellion extinction, and others which all promote left-wing Marxist communistic ideology, and they use anarchy, violence and lawlessness to achieve their aims. They are pro-LGBTIQ, pro-abortion, denying free speech to anyone who opposes them. They are anti anything that the Bible stands for and they will use any means to cancel those that stand opposed to them. Well, a further promotion of sexual lawlessness is reflected in many of the shows seen on television today. What we hear on the radio, presented on the internet, pushed on social media and watched at the movies. But more sadly, portions of the church around the world are ordaining homosexuals to ministry and giving their blessings not just upon same-sex relationships but the whole LGBTIQ movement. You see, the very things that God destroyed mankind for in Noah and Lot's time are being played out before our very eyes today. I mean, yes, we are to reach out to these people with the good news of Jesus Christ. But it is another thing to bring this, this lifestyle into the church or into our homes or even allow oneself to be entertained by what really is an abomination to God. Well, in Luke 17, 32, Jesus gives this warning. Remember Lot's wife. The angels said to Lot and his family this in Genesis 19. Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. Lot and his family ran, but his wife stopped and looked back. Now in Hebrew, looked back means more than to glance over one shoulder. It means to regard, to consider, to pay attention to. Lot's wife turned and watched the judgment of God as flaming sulphur fell from the sky, consuming everything she valued and held dear, because God knew what was treasured in her heart. And it is clear that Lot's wife compromised her faith. She had tolerated and accepted the wickedness which was manifested in Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And she too experienced the judgment of God being turned into a pillar of salt which stood looking over the Dead Sea area where to this day no life can exist. Where salt builds up in clumps along the shoreline of the sea. A poignant reminder to us not to look back from the profession of faith that we have made in Jesus Christ and not to compromise the word of God in our lives. We have to stand firm and follow Christ without hesitation within our hearts and with minds set on things above, not on earthly things. You see, this whole area of sexual perversion we've been addressing is an outright attack on a very important and godly image. Ephesians chapter 5. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. The union of a man and a woman is meant to be a visual reminder of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. And that is why marriage as ordained by God is under such attack. Now, when we talk about the increase of lawlessness in the world today, we'd probably all nod our heads in agreement. But let's just bring it a little bit closer to home. Has the spirit of lawlessness crept into your life or into my life? Romans 13 and verse 1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now, regardless of some of the laws around today, our government has still created many good laws for us to live by. When you drive down the road, are you mindful to stay within the speed limit? Do you slow down when you come to those 50 and 40 kilometre zones? How often do you use your mobile phone, phone while driving and keeping another eye open for the policeman around the corner? Do you declare everything on your tax returns? Do you reveal everything to Centrelink? Do you tell little white lies? Do you cheat at exams? Do you pilfer because everyone else is doing it? Are you enticed by the immorality of the internet, explicit magazines, or, or compromise what you watch on TV? Romans 13, verse 2. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Tough words, but it's God's word. Yes, let's be aware of the increase of lawlessness in the world, but you need to make a stand against lawlessness in any shape or form in your own life. Now, society is becoming absolutely lawless, which is preparing the way for the man of lawlessness, also known as the Antichrist, the man who is destined to rule the world. The coming new world order of Antichrist is going to be based upon four pillars, a global government, a global economy leading to a cashless society, a global religion and global lawlessness. Now we live in times where all these truths are accelerating on the world scene. Since the financial crisis of 2008 and COVID-19, political and religious leaders all around the world have been calling for the establishment of a new world order. The devil is now using the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset as a coordinated spearhead on the world scene to further pave the way for the coming kingdom of Antichrist, the final and ultimate world dictator who will stand in opposition to the things of God Almighty. Revelation 13, 7 and 8. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. The World Economic Forum meets every year in Switzerland. Now the people invited are the world's most powerful individuals, the global elite, who meet together to solve the world's problems, such as people like Bill Gates, George Soros, Prince Charles, Al Gore, the owner-shareholders of big tech, pharmaceutical, finance and big media companies, along with political leaders and VIPs from the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Now, the aim of the Great Reset, which was openly proclaimed and initiated on the 3rd of June 2020, is to create a world governing body by restructuring the world's economy, economy and geopolitical relationships 
to subdue all of humanity, imposing coercive measures with which to drastically limit freedoms of entire populations. The objective is to destroy capitalism, bringing in a socialistic Marxist type of world government where they control people's behaviour and change the face of business. You see, the Great Reset is an anti-democratic enterprise designed to destroy your job, steal your prosperity and rob your children and grandchildren of a future, yet promising peace and prosperity to all. Now, the founder of the World Economic Forum, Claude Schwab, has written several books on the Great Reset, which is Claus's masterpiece for the New World Order, or master plan, I should say. You see, the world is rapidly being propelled towards a new normal and will become the foundation of Antichrist's kingdom. Now, we didn't arrive at this point in our history overnight because the concepts behind the Great Reset are not new. They have slowly been put into place. The World Economic Forum is now the most powerful and influential group at the forefront in a long list of organisations that have down through the years been plotting and scheming to bring about a new world order. They are working hand in hand with the United Nations and their Agenda 30, which is all about a new world order. And this slide just mentions a few of those groups that all basically have the same aim. Now, Claude Schwab is very clear in his writings. He says that the coronavirus is not so much a crisis, but it's an opportunity to be exploited. It's a chance to accelerate the birth of the new world order. Now, there are many political leaders who are supportive of the Great Reset. President Joe Biden of America, Angela Merkel of Germany, Emmanuel Macron of France, Boris Johnson, Prime Minister of England, just to mention a few. And one of the main slogans of the Great Reset is Build Back Better, which all these people use. But it's interesting to note that in our own country of Australia, it was Senator Pauline Hanson in late 2020 who presented a proposal to the Senate to reject the World Economic Forum's damaging Great Reset policies. Her proposal was blocked 2 to 73 with only Malcolm Roberts voting to acknowledge the harm these unwanted policies would inflict on Australians. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. You see, these events on the world scene today, they are a reminder of another time in modern history which preceded the rise of Hitler in Nazi Germany, who was a type, of course, of the coming Antichrist. Just as the cancel culture movement today seeks to silence and eliminate anything they claim is distasteful from our history and not in line with their left-wing ideology, so it was in Germany in the 1930s that there was an effort to eliminate books and ideas that were viewed as being subversive or as representing ideologies opposed to Nazism. They held mass book burnings. They persecuted people who they deemed had the wrong ideology, especially the Jewish people. Now, in Nazi Germany, the people doing the persecution were the brown shirts of the Nazi party. Eventually, the cancel culture of that time, the brown shirts, mutated into a government agency of the Third Reich, the dreaded SS which then held the power to crush freedom in Germany and throughout Europe. You see, totalitarian regimes, they use lawlessness, anarchy, violence, social breakdown, political confusion, and they target established culture so as to prepare and open up the way for their tyranny. You see, this world and all who live in it are being prepared for the rise of the final totalitarian regime, the Kingdom of Antichrist, which will be established, as this slide indicates, in that final seven-year period that we call the Tribulation. Now, a primary tool in the arsenal of, of the globalists is fear, which goes hand in hand with control. They presented the horrors of climate change for decades, telling us to expect extreme weather events, loss of life and property, species and ecosystem loss. They said island nations are just going to be swallowed up by the sea. Our dams will never be full again. The earth will become uninhabitable. 
They promoted, used and continue to use Greta Thunberg, who has caused great anxiety amongst the younger generation by saying at the UN summit in 2019, we only have 12 years left, we're all going to die and I'll never forgive you. But you see, this alone has not impacted the masses as they hoped it would. An abundance of failed predictions along with an army of scientists who dispute the dire warnings of impending doom have diminished the effect of climate alarm on many people. The globalists needed a crisis that would impact everyone in the world and so when COVID-19 arrived on the scene, it has and it is being used to generate widespread alarm. Both climate change and COVID-19 are pretext for mass social control through fear. Now don't get us wrong, we have to care for our planet. We have to be good stewards of it. But we need to remember and understand our real enemy is not plastic bags, forks and knives or cows emitting too much CO2. The real problem for creation was when Adam and Eve rebelled against God and they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden and as Romans 8 verse 23 declares, the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. We have to understand that there is a bigger agenda behind climate change as there is with COVID-19. The Great Reset is encased in deception. It misuses and twists information with climate change and COVID-19. Just take the example of Al Gore, who's considered to be the champion of climate change. His first documentary in 2006 was a film called An Inconvenient Truth. Now, he made famous the polar bear on the floating block of ice, telling us that we're endangering, endangering the polar bears through climate change. In fact, the polar bear population in the 1950s was about 5,000. In 2007, the year after his film, it was around 25,000. Um, and uh, today it stands around 26,000. Sorry, let me just go back there. <clears throat> Endangering the bears through climate change. In fact, the polar bear population in the 1950s was about 5,000. In 2007, it was around 25,000. Today it stands around 26,000. Some say as high as 31,000. <coughs> while a UK High Court judge who ruled on whether the climate change film An Inconvenient Truth could be shown in UK schools said it contains nine scientific errors, yet it won two Oscars. One of Australia's leading people in climate change, Professor Tim Flannery, is well known for the false predictions which has cost Australian taxpayers billions of dollars as 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22 declares. Test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. You see, the whole evil plan for a new world order and its manipulation of COVID-19 is being presented for the so-called good of humankind. But just consider the following for a moment. Since COVID has been happening, an average of about 2.25 million people have died per year. Yet every day a child dies every six seconds from malnutrition, which totals about five million every year. Over nine million die from heart disease every year. The normal flu and pneumonia kills over 3.6 million. Every year over five million die of strokes and another five million are disabled by them. Cancer kills over seven million people annually. Someone in the world develops dementia every three seconds. There are over 50 million people worldwide living with dementia in 2020. And this number will almost double every 20 years. While the World Health Organization released a report stating one in 100 deaths around the world is by suicide. You see, compared to COVID-19, there are far bigger issues to be considered for the so-called good of humankind. You see, once again, the global elite are using the coronavirus to further their own agenda, and as Klaus Schwab said, it is an opportunity. But behind the chaos, the panic, the hopelessness, and human vulnerability in the world today, we find that people are becoming an easy prey for manipulation. We need to take up the sword of the spirit. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, 
but a spirit of power, love and of a sound mind. We need not succumb to the fear and deception tactics of the enemy, for we have God's power, we have his uh, unconditional love, and we have the ability to judge everything with a sound mind based on the word of God, the Bible. As Isaiah 41 verse 10 declares, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now part of the Greece Great Reset's plan is for all debt to be forgiven on an individual and national basis. Now who wouldn't want that? But in exchange for what? For the surrendering of your rights and freedoms. People are being conditioned for further government control and the global elite will not let go of the increased power over our lives, over your life, that they have achieved through the COVID-19 crisis. It's been stated that the coronavirus will come and go, but the government will never forget how easy it was to take control of your life, to control every sporting event, classroom, restaurant table and church pew, and how easy it was to restrict your movements and your finances. And as Claus Schwab says, you will own nothing, but you'll be happy. You see, deception and lies is one of the major areas in which Satan operates. And speaking of the devil, we read these words in John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Make no mistake about it, it is the devil who is behind the Great Reset as he continues to lay the foundation for the rise of the Antichrist and at the same time preparing the way for the truth of Revelation 13. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. With all of the advancements in technology today and the ongoing push towards a cashless society, such a global identification system which will have the power to lock you out of society is just around the corner. But of course the reality is you're, you're already being tracked every day, every hour through devices like your smartphone, QR codes, smart TVs, GPS, the internet, chips in your credit cards, Google Maps and the list just goes on. Yet, of course, the global elite, they promise peace and prosperity for all, which is another great deception of the evil one. 2 Corinthians 11. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Is it not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness? Their end will be what their actions deserve. While the United Nations, of course, has always believed that a new world order needs a new world religion, where all of your faiths are united for the sake of world peace. Remember one of the pillars of the Antichrist's kingdom. You see, for Antichrist to rule the earth, he must not only consolidate governments, economies and currencies, but also belief systems, because a new world order needs a new world religion. And there are many organisations working towards a global apostate religion, the World Parliament of Religions, the World Council of Churches, the Ecumenical Movement, the World Evangelical Alliance, while Pope Francis has been pushing hard for a global religion with his embracing and promotion of Chrislam, a merger of Christianity, Judaism and Islam. On the 4th of February 2021, the United Nations declared the first annual International Day of Human Fraternity, a day to celebrate what they call a one-world religion of Chrislam created by Pope Francis in Abu Dhabi in 2019. Now, the Catholic Muslim Interfaith Council announced that the United Arab Emirates is going to build a Chrislam headquarters, which will include a synagogue, a mosque and a church, and it will be opened later this year. Now, the same sort of compound is also being built in Berlin, Germany, called the House of One. And they are calling this a Chur Moskogog. A Chur Moskogog. You see, this ecumenical movement of all faiths, which rejects the infallibility of the Bible, is drawing many evangelical churches into its clutches. 
1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. All of these realities, they're just the tip of the iceberg in regards to the development of this lawless, apostate, global movement coming together. A movement, of course, that rejects the Bible as being the infallible word of God. Now, a further comparison of Noah and Lot's day in our time is brought out in Genesis 6, 11 and 12. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. In the time of Noah, it had come to the point where violence and bloodshed had become a way of life. And in the times in which we live, it is also characterised by those same realities. And society is becoming more and more desensitised to it. And this is especially impacting on our children. A survey done in America revealed the average child by age 12 watches 8,000 televised murders and 100,000 acts of violence, and that number more than doubles by the time they reach 18. In Ephesians chapter 2, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. The Greek word used for air is the air just above the surface of the globe. And this is the airspace where the radio, the social media, the internet, mobile phones and television transmissions travel to and fro across the circumference of the earth. You see, the media is a huge means by which Satan is influencing the minds and hearts of many people. And our generation is being exposed to even more violence than previous generations because of the advancement in technology. Does this have an effect on mankind? Absolutely. What we view and what we think about affects our actions. That's why we're given this exhortation in Romans 12 verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. The World Health Organization released a report stating more than one third of all women around the world are victims of physical or sexual violence. Family violence is rampant in our day and age. There have been more wars and war deaths in the last hundred years than all of your previous centuries put together. We had an average of 40 wars going on all over the world at any time since the end of World War II. Today, there are 100,000 peacekeeping troops stationed around the world in an effort to curb violence, evil and corruption. We have the growth of the religion of Islam, which accounts for nearly a quarter of the world's population. And the Quran calls for violence and aggression against followers of other faiths. Followers of Islam continue to carry out deadly terrorist attacks all around the world. The violence in the Middle East continues to focus upon Israel as her enemies seek to destroy the nation that God formed for his plans and purposes. Every day, terrorist organisations continue their evil plotting and scheming against the Jewish people with ongoing terror attacks. Since its re-establishment in 1948, the State of Israel has fought eight recognised wars and two Palestinian intifadas. And yet, of course, we sit in the comfort of our own homes, eating our dinner and watching these realities live on TV or on social media. A silent form of violence is being perpetrated all around the world by deliberate abortion of innocence. Abortion has been decriminalised in all states of Australia. A foetus can be aborted in many places in Australia with the signatures of two doctors right up to nine months. You see, the womb is now the most unsafe place in the world for Australian children. In our country, there are an estimated 80,000 children who are aborted each year through surgical means, though this figure does not include chemical abortions. While the World Health Organization estimates 42 to 50 million babies are discarded worldwide every year, which equates to 125,000 abortions every day. What does the word of God tell us about life? Psalm 139. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. 
Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. The unborn child from the moment of conception is made in the image of God which gives that child dignity and intrinsic value. Well, we read this further comment about Noah and Lot's times in Luke uh, chapter 17, 28 and 29. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulphur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating, drinking and marrying or conducting business or working hard. But when people become preoccupied or consumed with these things, they become careless and indifferent to the things of God. As the Bible declares in Mark 8, 36. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Despite the example of Noah and Lot's lives to their generations, people chose not to listen. They were absorbed in the pleasures and pursuits of this life, continuing to live in disobedience to God's word. They did not prepare themselves for the world to come. We need to have a proper perspective of material possessions in this life, seeing them as our servants, because the moment we begin to serve them, we are on a downward path. For Paul gave this exhortation in 1 Timothy 6.6. 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. The Lord will only allow lawlessness and its fruit to go so far. As in the days of Noah and Lot, there was a set time and then God's judgment fell. Genesis 6.13 So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And Genesis 19.15 With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. Now, when we think of the flood in Noah's day, we can almost have a very Sunday school image of it. You know, we know the song of the rains come down and the floods come up, but we don't tend to sing about the judgment, the death and the destruction that took place. The judgment of Noah and Lot's day was a horrific time, nowhere to run, nowhere to escape the unleashing of God's judgment through nature. The flood began as the heavens opened up, raining for 40 days and 40 nights. The fountains of the great deep were broken up. Worldwide undersea earthquakes along with volcanic eruptions leading to a worldwide flood. And in Lot's time, God rained down burning sulphur, which was impossible for the people to flee from its reach. And yet the word of God declares there is another specific time of worldwide judgment coming, just like the days of Noah and Lot. Isaiah 24, 1-6. See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The exalted of the earth languish. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore earth's inhabitants are burnt up and very few are left. To understand what this time of judgment will involve, one has to study the seven seals, the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of God's wrath in Revelation 6 through to 18, which precedes the second coming of Jesus in all power and glory. And so in Revelation 6, we are introduced to what is often called the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the first four seals that are opened. As the first seal is broken, a white horse is released and its rider has a bow, but no arrows, a reference to the rise of the Antichrist. The second seal releases the red horse of war and destruction and its rider is given power to take peace from the earth, resulting in mankind slaying one another. The third seal releases the black horse whose rider was holding a pair of scales, bringing global famine and economic collapse. The fourth seal releases the pale horse whose rider was named Death and Hades, who will be loosed with power to kill one-fourth of the earth with sword, famine, plagues or diseases and wild animals. Seal 5 speaks about martyrdom throughout that time. Seal 6, there is a great earthquake and there are natural disturbances in the sky. In the seventh seal are the seven trumpets. 
Trumpet one, the earth is smitten by hail and fire mingled with blood, resulting in one third of the trees and grass being destroyed. Trumpet two, the sea is smitten and one third of the life within the sea and the ships upon the sea are destroyed. Trumpet three, water is made bitter and many die. Trumpet four, the heavens are smitten and the light given out is reduced by one third. Trumpet five, the abyss is open and a demonic force torments mankind for five months. Trumpet six speaks again of war and one third of the earth's population being destroyed. Trumpet seven leads into the seven bowls of God's wrath. Bowl one, grievous sores are poured out upon those who've taken the mark of the beast. Bowl two, the sea is turned into blood and every creature in the sea dies. Bowl three, drinking water is turned into blood. Bowl four, people are scorched by the sun. Bowl five, there is a supernatural darkness and men gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Bowl six, is the campaign of Armageddon as the nations of the world converge one last time upon Jerusalem. And bowl seven is the greatest earthquake in history, along with a plague of hail, as the Lord Jesus returns. Now one purpose of those judgments is to turn people back to God, because God's judgments are always redemptive in nature. But listen to this sad reality in Revelation 16, 8 and 9. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues. But they refused to repent and glorify him. Here we have a timeline of Bible prophecy. We are currently in the church age, which will be brought to a conclusion when the rapture of the church takes place, followed by the day of the Lord, a theme that runs right through the Old and New Testament, beginning with a period of seven years. And it is a terrible time that is fast approaching this world where God will pour forth his judgments upon a lawless world. Obadiah, verse 15. The fourth angel poured out he... Oh, sorry. <laughs> the day of the Lord is near for all nations. Well, just like Noah's flood, these judgments and catastrophes will be happening on a global level. What's taking place in the world today really is like an early warning sign of that which is to come. But the tribulation is going to be far worse. Today, when a disaster happens, help comes from others around us, charities, governments, and even international assistance. But it'll be very different in the tribulation. The judgments of God will be happening everywhere, and the resources to deal with such catastrophes will be unable to cope. And as the prophet Daniel said at this time in Daniel 12 and verse 1, there will be a time of distress such has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. Well, was Noah's flood the result of global warming? No, it was the judgment of God upon a lawless world. And in Genesis 9 verse 11 following, this is what God said. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is a sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. There is a judgment coming upon this world, though it will not be by a flood as it was in Noah's day. And the sad reality is no one believed Noah's warning that the flood waters would come and destroy the world. In our time, the world does not want to hear of coming judgments. It is not a politically correct subject, but it is a topic that runs right the way through the word of God. They want to hear that God is a God of love. And Calvary, of course, is certainly evidence of that truth. But Calvary is also evidence that a holy God must judge sin. 2 Peter 3, 5 and 6. But they deliberately forgot that long ago by God's word the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Peter says learn from history but unfortunately the mistakes of history are so often repeated and the times of Noah and Lot are being replayed today. How are we to respond to the times in which we live? Well, Genesis 6 says this of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. You see, God always has a faithful remnant. 
Noah had a number of spiritual qualities that set him apart from the attitudes and values of those among whom he lived. Qualities that we need to emulate as the faithful bride of Christ, preparing ourselves for the coming of our heavenly bridegroom. You see, Noah was righteous. He had a heart for the things of God. He valued the word of God above everything else in his life. Noah allowed God's word to shape his character, his lifestyle and his direction in life. And we read the same sort of comment about Lot in 2 Peter 2. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Righteousness is what set Lot apart. And of course righteousness though can be very distressing when you are surrounded by evil, wickedness and great lawlessness. As we've been reminded, in this day and age there is an ever increasing cost to stand up for righteousness. But Noah was blameless and he walked with God. He not only believed God could save him, but he also believed that God would save him and consequently walked in that revelation, being completely obedient, doing all that God had told him to do. Above all, though, we are told that Noah walked with God. Noah kept his relationship fresh with the Lord every day. He was not perfect, as we are not perfect, but no doubt, he kept short accounts with God, walking closely with him in all the affairs of his daily life. Matthew 4 and verse 4. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. For Noah, it took 120 years of faithfulness, diligence and consistency in spiritual matters. He had to persevere and to follow all of God's instructions. There was no sign of rain, let alone a flood. Building the ark required faith because it must have looked absolutely ridiculous in the eyes of the people to build a huge ship on dry land with only small rivers as possible waterways because Noah would have been more than 100 kilometres away from the nearest ocean. And to make matters worse, when Noah told the people that God was going to flood the earth, he would have looked even more ridiculous since it had never rained before in the history of the earth. Genesis chapter 2. The only thing he had to stand on was the word of God. But Noah feared God more than he feared man. And he was prepared to go God's way no matter what it cost him. We need to live in God's word and obey it because our spiritual survival depends upon it. But we also read these words about Noah in Hebrews 11 verse 7. By faith, Noah, when warned about things, things not yet seen in holy fear built an ark to save his family by his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith and 2 peter 2 verse 5 god saved noah one of eight people a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood of the on the world of the ungodly you see in the midst of judgment there was hope for the god of abraham isaac and jacob is a god of hope noah had to build an ark and for over 100 years, Noah was no doubt a pre-flood preacher of righteousness. He didn't preach a popular message, but he proclaimed the truth. He preached the pure word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword, a message of repentance, the call for people to turn away from their sin. You see, when we look at the character of Noah, we can see the marks of the faithful remnant that will make up the bride of Christ in these last days. A bride that will be faithful and walking in God's will and obeying his word. A bride that will be regularly led and guided by the Holy Spirit, being preachers of righteousness and holiness, holding out the word of life to a crooked and perverse generation. But you see, in being the Lord's ambassador, Noah would have undoubtedly been accused of being judgmental, fear-mongering and critical, labelled self-righteous, a crackpot and an object of great ridicule and derision. It takes faith to build an ark on dry ground. It takes faith to build an ark when it's never rained. It takes faith to build an ark when everyone is ridiculing you and refusing to heed the warning. But by faith, Noah and his family prepared for the coming flood and for that which they even did not fully understand. And so the testimony of Noah's faith remains with us today while the rest of the world perished. Our faith, faces the same sort of challenges. Though in our day and age we're not called to build an ark because Jesus himself is the ark of our salvation. 
And surely the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, appears to be as foolish in the eyes of our generation as building an ark on dry ground appeared to be in Noah's time. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The ark of salvation has been prepared and it is up to us to sound the warning by faith just like Noah of that which is coming upon this world. By faith we have to be preachers of righteousness, proclaiming the full gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified, buried, raised again by the power of God, ascended back to the right hand of the Father and that he's coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords in whom God the Father has entrusted all authority for judgment. We need to proclaim there are only two eternal destinies, heaven and hell. And as we do, there will be many who will laugh, they will ridicule, they will criticise, they will persecute and they might even take us to court. But we cannot water down the gospel because we do not want to offend people or because we fear the anti-vilification laws or because we are under the pressure of those minority groups to compromise our faith or because we don't want to look foolish. Because if you water down the gospel, you will strip it of its power. Romans 1, 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. One day, just as God closed the door onto the ark, there's coming a, door, a day when God will close the door to the age of grace. Genesis 6, verse 3. My spirit will not always strive with man. And you could just imagine in Noah's time when the rain began to fall and the floods of the great deep were opened up that you could hear another sound. <laughs> Noah, Noah, open up, save us. We believe you now. But there was nothing more that Noah could do for them because God had closed the door. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to confess that you are a sinner and to repent before God, acknowledging Jesus as the Son of God, that he willingly died on a cross, shedding his blood for the forgiveness of your sin and that he rose again and that he lives forevermore. Today is the opportunity to flee from the wrath to come, just like the days of Noah and Lot, by turning to Jesus, the ark of your salvation, and receiving him as your Saviour and Lord. For those already in Christ, the Lord did not tell us of these coming judgments to make us disheartened or to discourage us. Just as Noah and Lot, along with their families, were spared from the wrath of God, so when our faith is in Jesus, we too are not destined for God's punishment. The Apostle Paul declared in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, when speaking about the day of the Lord, he said, we're not destined for the wrath of God. In 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, he said that Jesus will rescue us from the coming wrath. In Revelation 3 verse 10, Jesus said that we'll be kept from the hour of trial coming upon the whole earth. And the means of our deliverance will be the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. My friends, one day, and may it be soon, the trumpet of the Lord will sound. And I'd just like to sound the, that trumpet, Lord willing, to remind us of that wonderful and blessed hope that we have. Amen. That will sound one day, and I trust that, that we one. will be ready for it. My friends, may we too continue to be about our Father's business until we hear the sound of that last trumpet of the church age, where we will be caught up together to be with our Lord forevermore. The prophetic scriptures today, they all have one common thread that runs through them. 
whether we are looking at the nation of Israel and all of the prophecies that are being fulfilled there and the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39 about a Russian Islamic invasion of Israel in the last days, an alliance that is firmly in place today, whether we are looking at prophecies out of Daniel 2 and 7 about Europe in the last days, whether as Revelation 17, Mystery Babylon in more detail, this worldwide apostate religion, or whether it's a message like Noah, the common thread running through all of your prophetic scriptures today is this. The hour is late. The hour is late. And God is still looking for Noahs who will walk with him, hear his word, and live in complete obedience to that word, regardless of the persecution, the pressures and ridicule that may come, so that the purposes of God can be completed throughout the earth. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you, Lord, that your word gives us your perspective on what's taking place today. Lord, I just pray that you will encourage each and every one here today, or those that are watching, Lord, that we might not compromise your word lord but rather we will be a people that speak your truth in love lord that you will use us in these very last days to your glory and to your honor lord i pray that you will encourage each one and strengthen our hearts to remain loyal to you and may we set our heart and mind on things above and not on the things of this world that are just but passing away for we'd ask this in your wonderful name lord amen amen